Okay. There we are. All right. Hi, friends. So I am here with my sweet friend, Raywin Guerrero, and she and I are going to be talking about setting personal boundaries in romantic relationships. Um, so we got on the subject of this the other day when we were chatting. I was kind of sharing some of my experience um, that kind of led me to coaching. And same with her. And some toxic relationships that <laughs> came up and we were like, we should really talk about this. Um, and because I have a workshop coming up on April 13th, where I'm going to be talking specifically about setting personal boundaries and sticking to them, because a lot of us women especially have a hard time with it. Um, and so today we're going to be talking specifically about romantic relationships and um, codependency and like what a boundary is and what a boundary isn't, because I think we're probably all more familiar with what a boundary isn't <laughs> than what it is. So, um, so Ray, won't tell everybody a little bit about what you do before we dig in. Yeah, thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to, to talk about this, because I feel like it's so pivotal with what I see in my practice with women who have struggled with autoimmune issues or burnout or fatigue or chronic, um, you know, fibromyalgia, some of these, these Hashimoto's like, it's such a huge issue. So um, I started off in that sort of like the mind body world, looking at psychology and um, CBT and hypnotherapy, moved into corporate wellness. And then ironically, in that uh, that 10 year period of working in corporate wellness, burnt out and ended up with a ton of gut issues, fertility issues, um, skin issues, like all the things. It was really unpleasant. And I didn't find any relief within the conventional medical world. And I was told that everything that I was going through was either in my head. So there's a lot of medical gaslighting going on mm -hmm. or that it was um well, that's just normal. That's just part of like, you know, being 30, you should be on tons of medications. Like, and <laughs> I just refused to accept that because I had seen what medications had done to my grandfather. He had been on multiple medications for anxiety when I was growing up and it led to um, him developing multiple strokes. So anytime that you're on a psychopharmaceutical for longer than six months, it starts doing things to your brain and actually changing the molecular structure and cellular structure of your body. So my big wake up call was seeing what happened to him. And then when I ended up getting like, IBS and all these other things, you know, I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat dairy anymore. I could, there's lots of stuff that went down. I was like, there has got to be a real reason behind this. So I kept looking and, you know, worked with several different types of practitioners. You know, I went through homeopathy, um, Reiki, um, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, her, you know, drinking some really disgusting things. <laughs> And then eventually stumbled, I because of my job, thank God, because of my job, I used to bring in speakers every month. And I brought in this functional nutritionist to talk about children's immune health. And she was talking about how antibiotics like wipe out your gut bacteria for up to a year. And you could end up with like food allergies, um, seasonal allergies. Uh, like if you don't have the right levels of good gut bacteria, how you become more... Um, uh, prone to colds and flu so like your immunity goes totally down you can end up with eczema asthma I was like oh my god like migraines I was like I have all of those things and you could feel really tired I'm like check 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 so <laughs> that was sort of my wake-up call to the fact that I had been on about 50 courses of antibiotics up until that time that was in my early 30s I was 31 and I realized like I can't continue to live like this. Like I can't keep taking drugs and thinking that I'm going to be okay because clearly they're not helping me and I keep getting sick and all the doctors have to offer is like, we'll take this pill. So my, um, my work now is about integrating the psychology with the nutrition. And a lot of what I see is like people come in with physical symptoms and physical manifestations of things. I was just mentioned some of them like lupus, Hashimoto's, MS, Lyme disease, like some, you know, anxiety, burnout, chronic fatigue, these things all do like there, there is a cellular component to them, like a biochemical component that can be addressed with food, but that's never the whole story. And there's always this, this psycho-emotional layer that needs to be unpacked. And I'm so grateful for the training that I've had that's, that allows me to not only work on that biochemical level, but to work on this really deep, like getting to the root of why people don't say yes to themselves, why they make poor choices, why they people please. And I'm a recovering people pleaser. Um, 
right? <laughs> I think that's why we're here because we we had that conversation. You know, I I had been in a my first marriage was um was it very healthy? You know, I did a lot of things just to keep the peace with him, and it uh, it was very verbally you know he's very manipulative and verbally abusive. Um, and then I think there was a day where it he crossed a line, and I just thought you know what this is not going to get any better, and I'm going to have to to walk. So because, you know, I had taken and taken and taken until the point I was like, I can't take anymore. And I'm not a fighter. Like, I don't want to fight with you. So I'm just gonna exit. Yes. So um, yeah, this is all this ringing bells. Yep. And, and it's so similar, even the age. Um. <laughs> yeah, 30 is a big age. Spiritually, it's quite a, a big age. Um. So yeah, I was I think it was right before my 31st birthday, we parted ways. I uh yeah, literally like a week before, like a week before I said, you know what, this isn't going to work out for me anymore. I think it was, I think it was right after my 31st birthday. And I was like, we're done. Like for real this time we're done. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, so I had adrenal fatigue. Um, I don't know that I have celiac disease cause I'm not going to go back and find out for sure, but gluten does not settle well. And, you know, I know that there's like a genetic predisposition there, but Mm -hmm. the stress that I was put under from the relationship that I was in Mm -hmm. absolutely (laughs) exacerbated what was going on. Um, same with all the antibiotics. I had chronic sinus infections. I was on antibiotics at least twice a year. Usually, I mean, sometimes four or five, it just, it just depended on how bad it was a year. Um, I can't imagine what my gut, my gut was like at that point. And, you know, so what got me kind of thinking about all of this um, was, you know, the boundary issue. And I really, you know, we had a discussion about this. I talked to my husband about this last night and I was like, I, I've been afraid to talk about this publicly because I have this very irrational fear that he will see something, the ex will see something. Um, and, you know, talking to my husband about this the other day, I was like, well, why do I care? Like, what is he going to say? What is he going to do? You Mm -hmm. know, you're only telling Um, the truth. Yeah. I mean, it's my side, right? (laughs) I don't claim to have been perfect in that relationship, but there was so much that happened that was not healthy and not appropriate Mm -hmm. and was not on me. And so that's, you know, I know my role and what happened and, you know, it took me 31. um, I was, so I was standing in my backyard one day, I was working on a garden and I had this thought, I was like, well, he could die first. <laughs> and that's the face I made to myself after that thought came. And I was like, girl, you are 31. What you and y'all saying? are not even married. Like we weren't even married. Wow. <laughs> I was like, I think that is really like my sign that I need to get out of this relationship. Um, and, you know, part, part of what made it difficult was there's a lot of financial abuse going on. Like he did not carry his weight financially. Mm-hmm. And you know, I didn't even realize that until a few weeks ago that like there, that that's the term for that. I had just never kind of, I know, I know what financial abuse is. Like I know what I was in with him, but I never put that together for myself and, you know, thinking about how that impacted my mental health. Um, like it got so bad that I started getting a rash up here and I called it my hate rash <laughs> because I went to my dermatologist and she's like, oh, are you like really stressed out? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah. And she said, oh, it's just, you know, hormones. And I'm like, this is the physical manifestation. <laughs> like you can see it on my face lady. Um, and it's interesting too. You go to, you go into a situation like that, like she's a dermatologist, but you know, our, our medical system does it, that looks at the symptom. Yeah. It doesn't look at, okay, you're really stressed out. What's going on? Like, Mm -hmm. how can I help you? Like how, you know, who can I refer you to? Like, there was no discussion like that. Mm -hmm. Um, like, like, okay, well now that we know that you're getting a rash, that's telling us that there's something going on. The stress, the cortisol is impacting your mucosal lining and that is showing up on your skin because now you've got particles, leak, you know, and this is the, the thing that people don't get, like the more stressed you are, the more you're damaging the lining of your gut. So the leakier it becomes and you're actually, your, your body can't cope with it. So stuff starts getting through and then those particles and antigens, they start showing up. Your liver isn't able to do its job and it starts showing up on your skin, shows up with sinus infections, low immunity. So, I mean, there's so much, uh, you know, when I hear like when, just now when you said, oh, she's like, oh, it's just stress. I'm like, 
that is not okay to say it's just stress. There's something you can do about it. Like so much that you can do about it. Okay. It can be fixed. <laughs> right? Not I mean, thank you for the cortisone, but. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Mm. And you know, so thinking about this just completely opened this can of worms for me. And, you know, it's a part of that, that what I was saying to my husband yesterday. So I was like, I just need to talk through this. And he's like, go for it. Yeah. Um, and it was like, you know, part of this too, like they have that irrational fear, but I also realized that like talking about this publicly, I have packed so much away and I have to bring it back out. And, but I, in that conversation with him too, I was like, but I can't, I can't keep that tucked away and talk about boundaries, right. And talk about codependency and talk about all these things in a very abstract way. <laughs> like it has to be my personal experience because yeah, that's, that's why coming. that's exactly where it's coming from. That's why you're seeing how important it is. And that's why you need to like, let people know there is a reason why I'm talking about this because I've lived it. This is a lived experience for me. And I get really nervous about saying the word abuse, but it was so abusive and because it has so much weight behind it, but you know, but like there is not another word for what happened to me. Like it was emotional and financial abuse and, mm -hmm. you know, so many people experience it and we don't even realize it. And so well, this know, like is the first time I'm talking about it too. Like I've never spoken about it publicly. Like some of my very good girlfriends, you know, they know what happened because they had to rally and bail me out of that situation. I slept on people's couches, but I've never really spoken about, you know, when I was 31 and my life went like up in smoke <laughs> and because of the situation that I was in with someone that, you know, same thing, he wasn't working for like two years and I was taking care of a lot of stuff and it just became too much. And it sounded too like, you know, just so similar to my experience, my ex really this is what, this is what abusive people do. And I want to, I want to preface this with too, this, <laughs> this too, that nobody wakes up every morning and being like, I'm off to abuse again today. <laughs> you know, like nobody's consciously doing that. It is a pattern of behavior that we, you know, create from an early age, usually based on stuff that we've experienced is usually yeah. from our parents and our family. And then we go out in the world and we spread whatever we grew up with. And, you know, so I get that. Like I, when I think about him, I do have empathy for him. I have sympathy and empathy for him. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, like I cannot let that trump <laughs> what I experienced. And so I always, I won't, always want to preface this with like, I'm not, I don't want to be judgmental, No, but I also have my, my piece to say. And so everything I say in this mm -hmm. <laughs> is my perspective. Right. Um, but you know, so some of what you described was, you know, your ex trying to isolate you from people and, you know, and, and he tried that with me too for years. And, you know, my mother always told me how, how stubborn I am. And I think in that capacity, it served me well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I'm not letting you cut me off from people that I care about. Right. Um, you know, any new girlfriend I got, he would immediately be jealous of and perceive her as a threat. And I knew even like, at least subconsciously, why he was doing that. Like he was afraid that someone was going to convince me to leave. Him. Right. Anytime yeah. I started to make progress in my career, I wanted to try something new, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the pattern, right? It was, I know, I know it's, you're just, you're bringing up so many things that I, you know, stuff that you can't unhear or unsee um, stuff that you just think, oh my gosh, I wish I could forget some of those comments like that were so, you know, degrading and depreciating and just, yeah, like so many things that I've heard. And, and a lot of it was around work because even though he wasn't working and I was, and I was working in this corporate job and I, you know, I, I was friends with like the head of HR and the head of this and the head of that. And I was hanging out with them and he hated that. Like my Friday nights were like socializing and that I wasn't one, but I'm like, I come home to you and you don't even kiss me. Hello. Yeah. You don't, you, the house is a mess. Like you've been home all day and I come home to basically, I've just done 12 hours of work and I got to come back and clean up after you now. And you can't even give me a kiss. Hello. Cause you're like depressed or whatever it was, was going on with him. Like he was in a, he was playing drums and he, he changed careers like every two months, like he was doing something new. Like he's like, Oh, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be this. And 
And that was a lot for, you know, I think for the first six months, I was like, okay, cool, find yourself. Like, I get that people need to figure out what they're meant to be doing, find a purpose. But then it just kind of rolled on and on and on. And there was very little empathy from him for seeing me dealing with all the stuff that I was dealing with and instead started to turn it like, oh, well, now you think you're too big for your boots because you have all these high powered friends and, you know, um, because I was getting, you know, I was doing well. And that's, you know, some of the relationships that I built during that time is, is what actually allowed me to end up in my corporate wellness career. Because when I got to the point where I walked away from him, my boss at the time, he said, well, what is it that you really want in life? You know, he was very empathetic. And he said, what do you really want? And I said, I, I want to help people like I really, really want to help people. And I think I'm going to have to go back to school and retrain. And, and he says, so how about, how about you help people right here? And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And he said, well, how about we give you like this corporate wellness job? He said, because we have a lot of problems with people going off sick. We have a lot of stuff. We need somebody to lead this. He says, I think you'd be perfect for it. And I was like, oh my God, yes, yes. So, so it was interesting. It was like the second I walked away from my ex-husband all this whole other world just opened up for me instantly, like instantly. And it was sort of like confirmation or affirmation that I was be like, you're on the right path. Like, this is where you're supposed to go, you know? So, um, so yeah, just by saying yes to myself, which was what was interesting about when I decided, I was like, no, no more. I can't do this anymore. I can't come home afraid of world war three erupting every single night. Um, And then trying to like mouse away because I just don't want the fight. Yeah. Uh, because I was it like fight you was talking about chronic fatigue like it's exhausting fighting with someone or trying to stick up for yourself or even suppressing yourself suppressing yourself and suppressing your voice is exhausting yes it's exhausting. you hit the nail on the head it was like I had to pretend to be and I mean eventually I feel like I kind of became like a very watered down version of myself so that I wouldn't rock the boat Right. Exactly. Cause you're like, I just want peace. I don't want, I don't want the fight, you know? So and like I, he was so unpredictable. Um, like I could have asked him the same question an hour apart and gotten a completely opposite answer, like a personal opinion on something because it was whatever suited his mood in the moment. It was bizarre. And that is gaslighting. <laughs> yeah. So much gaslighting. I would, I just never knew what was going to make him flip a lid. Yeah. And I mean, it was just eggshells all the time. And, you know, I think about, like, I'm trying to think back to that time in my life and just how effed up the whole thing was. And like, I knew it was, Mm -hmm. but I also saw that was the dynamic my parents had. And because of that, I thought that was normal. Like, I really thought before I went to therapy that you got married, you were miserable, and then you had kids and like everything was over. Oh my God. Because that is what my parents' attitude was. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, so when I did finally find the right therapist, like I went through a few, I had the nodder. Like she would just nod. Oh boy. It's like I can do this with my dog for free. Yeah, right? that's why I don't practice things like that. I I hated that. <laughs> like, oh dear, oh dear. But I found this amazing therapist, and she talked to me about codependency. She talked to me about boundaries. She talked to me about just you know toxic behavior, like all of these things that I was surrounded by. And I was like, oh, this isn't normal. No. And one of the things she said to me, I remembered this today. She was talking about codependency. And she said, if you're really codependent, when you get into a normal, healthy relationship, it can seem boring. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's no, there's none of this high and low and like excitement and passion and crazy passion and stuff like it, you know? Yeah. And she was like, you need to get to the point where you're gotta be, you're you're okay with that. Like Mm -hmm. you need to work your head around that. If like, if you want to meet somebody and have a healthy relationship, like you can't have that expectation and I was like you know that I'm okay with that like I didn't know that a relationship didn't have to be that way because I'm not that way like I'm a very excuse me I'm a very even keeled person like I certainly get upset but it takes a lot right and then I was living with somebody who made me yell every day wow because I had no choice 
Wow. Like that was what I had to do to be hurt with him. And it would escalate. This is codependence. It would escalate. And then it would drop back down because he would get scared into submission, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. And then it would escalate again. And it was yeah. over and over and over and over. But that is a, called, it's just like a cycle of destruction. Yeah. Like it's so destructive. And you know, what's sad about him is that you you just never know if someone like that ends up getting the help that they need because, you know, you hit on a really good point. You had empathy for him. When I had first met my first husband and this was, this has been my play all along. Like I always fall for the tortured soul or I did until recently. Um, the tortured guy, because, um, you know, I have a healer's heart. Like I want to help people. I want to fix them. Like, oh don't worry I'll help you I'll and he told me like all his stories about like his dad was abusive his real dad he had an adopted father who he ended up taking his adopted father's name but his real dad used to beat up on him and his mom when he was a little boy they had to flee like so I knew his story and instead of me saying red flag run I was like oh come here I'll take care of you yeah I'll fix it all for you yeah I'll take care of you and that I saw from my own mother you know, her entire way of reason for being was to be needed. And when she did not feel needed, she didn't understand if she felt like no one loved her, you know, and I saw how it turned out, how it manifested in her body into cancer because her, all her children grew up, everybody moved away. She didn't have anyone needing her. And my dad was a very independent and still is very independent man. He didn't want to just like, sit him on the porch and, and get old with her he wanted to he still had dreams he still had things he wanted to do so he had like this whole other lease on life once we left the house but for her she just kind of withered away like once everybody was gone so all the children were gone because she was like well nobody needs me anymore and there was a lot of codependency in their marriage that I see now like I totally see that as well and I see that for her and, you know, maybe for me at the start, like, you know, my first 10, 15 years of being in long-term relationships, it was like, oh, the way to, to keep the relationship going is to make sure that someone needs you, right? And, and that's not a conscious, that wasn't conscious, by the way, okay? Like, just to be clear, that was not conscious. However, the experience and the trauma of going through a divorce and separating your lives and all that stuff, you do wake up to the fact, like, I have got some problems here. Like, I... I've been thriving off of this person needing me and then getting pissed off when they need me too much because I can't give anymore because now yeah. I'm now empty. I'm now empty. Like I'm drained because they're like, well, you said that you'd be there for me no matter what. And I'm like, yo, I didn't really expect that it was just going to go on forever and that there would be nothing to come and fill back up my cup. Like mm -hmm. my cup is now completely dry. Taking and taking and taking. Yes, exactly. Dry. Like, and you get to that point. I was like, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm sick all the time. So I think for you, like, just like with me, I was like, I'm getting sick all the time. And he didn't even care. Like, I remember one day, yes. like I said, there's some things I wish I could forget, but this one thing, like I had been throwing up throughout the night. I had this job where I was having to get up and go to work for six o'clock in the morning. And I said, honey, can you just drop me to the, cause we, you, you can't park in, in London. I was living in London and you can't really park. So I said, can you just drop me to work? It's like a 15 minute drive at five 30 in the morning. If there's traffic. It could be an hour. Right. I was like, it's 50 minutes. Just drop me to work. It's freeze. It's January. It's freezing outside. And he's like, there's a bus stop outside. Just go get the bus, you know? And I'd been like up vomiting all night and I had to go into work and I just, like I said, there's just certain things like when I had to fill out the thing on the divorce form, like for like um, unreasonable behavior, I listed that as one of <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> I was like unreasonable behavior, just expecting me to like my body's physically unable to keep moving. And I'm just saying, please just like take me into work. The car, he just didn't want to get out of bed. He's just like, get a bus. There's a bus stop outside. Stand in the cold for 15 minutes, wait for a bus at five in the morning and get your ass into work at 6 a.m. You know? And yet, if the tables were turned, you know, right. and that's what's sad. Like, and I, I feel, I do feel, you know, like I'm talking about, like, we're not really in touch. Like every now and then I hear from him, like when my mom passed, he got in touch and he obviously still stalks my Facebook because um, we're not connected on Facebook, but I'm like, oh, he knows about me. You know, he texted me and he said, oh, I heard your mom passed away. I'm really sorry. She was a nice lady. And I'm like, yeah, she, she wasn't, she really did love him for whatever reason. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, I, I feel sorry, but at the same time, I'm not complete. I'm like, no, I, it was an experience that taught me to stand up for myself and to love mm-hmm. myself. And all these things, they are ultimately there to teach you how to honor your boundaries, how to honor and know what you're worth and what you're not prepared to deal with and what you deserve. Like, I didn't deserve someone to be so callous and cold to me, right? I deserve better than that. And now my, you know, if anything that happens in my life, my husband's like running around, my my current husband, well, real husband, I, I can feel like he's my soulmate. Like he'll be there, you know, whenever there's that song ain't no mountain high enough like during the pandemic we were separated I was in England and he was in California and it was like seven months that went by and he actually showed up in between even though there's like no travel to England there's a 14-day quarantine and I got to, I picked him up in the airport and he I said oh my god I can't believe you're here like I haven't touched you in like four months like what's going on and he's like baby ain't no mountain high enough and I was just like oh that's why you're like my man <laughs> That's why we got married very quickly after that. He was just like, this is crap. Like we're not spending any more time apart from each other, but not someone who would ever hurt you. Who's always looking like, how can I make your life better? You know, how do I give you the space to grow? So I think in terms of um, boundaries, like we have so many good boundaries between us now too. Like I will tell him straight up, like I got this going on. I got that going on. You know, um, I can't come do that thing that you want me to do. Like it's, Mm -hmm before I kind of had to do everything so the people pleasing has completely been washed out of my system like I feel like all the universal laundry cycles (laughs) of trauma from bad boyfriends and ex-husbands is just like that's no longer a thing yeah it took me a really long time like we've been married be 10 years in October so and then together 11 and you know I love him to pieces like (laughs) it was like I love you even more I, than I did, you know, when we met and, right? you know, I, that was, you know, I think a fear of getting married. I'm like, what if things go horribly wrong? I mean, after everything that I'd been through, it was like, am I making the good decision? And I was thinking about this this morning. So when I met him, before I met him, like I, I went therapy, I learned about codependency. I learned about boundaries and you know, I learned about actual intimacy, you know, not, not sex, which uh, we, we equate sex and intimacy. Right. And it's like, so not the same thing. Like, yes, sex can be part of intimacy, but it is in no way the end all be all <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's not necessary right um but you know so I'd done all this work on myself and I met him and I was like he is amazing like he is perfect what is wrong with him <laughs> and he had the same thing about me <laughs> he went on a date with one of my friends <laughs> Because we'd had concert tickets. I forgot that I was going out of town and I posted on Facebook. I was like, can somebody, you know, pick up this ticket for me? Yeah. He's like, oh, I'll do it. And um, I was like, that is so sweet. Because my friend also didn't have a car. So he had to go pick her up and, you know, they went out together. And um, so like they were hanging out and he was like, so what's wrong with Maggie? Like, there's got to be a catch. She's amazing. What's wrong with her? And my friend was like, nope, she's just really picky. So you should feel special. And he was like, right. Oh. That's good. And I took him and I shopped him around to everybody. I was like, what is wrong with him? You tell me there's gotta be something. And everybody's like, no, he's awesome. (laughs) I was like, okay, you should move in. Um, So uh, I want to stop for just a second and talk about what codependency is. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an, (laughs) it's, it's depending on somebody else. And so, you know, there's the caretaker, um, and I looked at these and I was like, oh, I was all three of these, so, all three of these. So there was the caretaker, right? You know, you're the helper, giver, supporter. Mm-hmm. You feel like you have to be there for everybody at all times. Like, mm-hmm. like you're talking about your mom and, you know, I was thinking about this too. And I was like, you know, there's always some codependency in raising children, but then the goal is to, at some point, not be codependent anymore. <laughs> like let them spread their wings and fly. Um, so my daughter's almost seven. I'm like, oh, and sometimes I'm like, oh, this is so codependent. <laughs> in a very joking she, way she literally does need you like she yeah, is, exactly she is like not formed yet she's gotta yeah. yeah like if she's 18 in that way then I'd be yes worried. then we're gonna have a problem if she's coming into bed at my bed every night right but, right yeah um, so I will not be going to college with her as much as I would like to um <laughs> you know and then there's the romance and relation ad- addict where you know I you feel like you have to be at somebody at all times to feel validated as a human being um and I see this with, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I, like, this is my mom. Um, 
And, you know, it, and it's so dangerous, I think, to be in that place of codependency where you feel like you have to be with somebody because you can't make a good decision, right? It's, it's whoever, whoever will take you. And, you know, there's so many things that go along with that about, you know, like not having good self-esteem and not feeling confident and, you know, all those things. Um, and then the Messiah complex, you have to be the savior. You got to be, you got the big R rescue on you. And my sister used to say this to me, she's like, take the R off your shirt, girl. <laughs> you cannot help everybody. You're like, not a superhero. Like, just let it go. You're not a superhero. <laughs> I can fix him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are the, like the three main types of somebody, you know, being codependent. And like, I looked at this list recently and I was like, oh, that was me. Um, I, I will say I wasn't, I didn't have to be in a relationship, um, but desperately wanted to be like, I was single for several years in my early twenties. Um, so I just couldn't find the right person and I am picky, then dated the guy. And then when we broke up, I was like, I am not dating anybody for a very long time. And that was a huge step for me um, to be, feel comfortable being alone and and indefinitely. Like, I was like, I don't, I need a magical unicorn. Mm -hmm. And if I find that person, then we will be together. But if it's not a magical unicorn, it is a doubt. Yeah. That's what I talk about. Knowing what you deserve. Like you need to know what you deserve. And if anything is like short of that, don't settle for it. Just don't. It's not worth I don't it. Need it. Um, at that point too, it was like, I, I would, you know, I was in my early thirties. I was like, you know, I would like to be a parent, but we, I had a conversation with the ex where he told me straight up. He was like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a parent. He was like, I'm not going to be a good parent. I was like, okay, well, I mean, you know that, although he is a parent now, mm-hmm. <laughs> not with me. Thank goodness. Well, you dodged a bullet there. Oh, so. I did. Yeah. I that sure was, did. That was God looking out for you. Ooh, I know, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, looking back on that conversation, I was like, okay, well, I've got that answer for myself. And I also realized in that moment, too, it was like being parenting with him would have, I mean, maybe ruined my life. I don't know. I, I don't know a different way to say it, but just the thought of like, getting child support out of him because I was like, we're not going to stay together. Like, yeah, so I don't yeah, want, you know, I, I don't. And then the idea of parenting with him, like the yeah. amount of therapy <laughs> I feel like that my child would need after being parented with some, by somebody like that. And the constant, you know, probably arguing that would have happened and just the, you know, that being at odds with each other. I was like, I don't want to do that. No. And I would rather do that by myself than do that with him. And, and, and do it with somebody who's not going to be an equal partner. And after becoming a parent, I have realized that I was absolutely right in that. Mm-hmm. Like it still would have been easier because I was like, I will find a way to have a baby. I will adopt. I will foster. I will find somebody to borrow sperm from, like whatever, you know, yeah. like, make it happen, but not with him. Um, and I stick to that. And so um and the other thing I want to talk about too is, you know, what a healthy boundary and a boundary, right. Is separating your feelings from somebody else's like, that's the definition mm-hmm. of an emotional boundary. Um, and so if you need that, you think about like the codependency, right. Your, your feelings are all mixed in with everybody else's. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so being able to separate those and say, okay, I am not responsible for this other person's feelings. I am not responsible for what happens to this person. I am not responsible for my husband finding a job, <laughs> you know, or the being other way around me. too. the other way around too, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, there's a really great book called, um, the subtle art of not giving a, an F and it's awesome. Like y'all go read it. It's amazing. Um, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a book club sometime, but it really talks about a lot of that. Um, and so I had some examples here that I wanted to make sure we cover too of um you know some some examples of not having good boundaries are you know taking responsibility for somebody else's feelings like we were talking about with codependency letting somebody else dictate your feelings so I got told a lot as a kid I'm too sensitive the ex would tell me I'm too sensitive and now that is a red flag if you if somebody tells you you are too sensitive they don't give any care in the world what you have to say they're telling you you're too sensitive 
because they don't like your feelings that you're having towards them in that moment. Mm -hmm. That's the too sensitive. And it's the most, I think the most admissive, dismissive thing that you could possibly say to somebody. <laughs> totally. Oh my God. Um, and I got it all the time. Anytime he didn't like what I had to say. Um, and then sacrificing your needs for others. Right. I can't mm -hmm. think of how much I sacrificed over that 10 years that we were together that I could have been doing other stuff, but it was all yeah. about him and him dragging me down. And like, I, I felt like I was dragging him through life. Yeah. You know, to try and keep at your level with you, but he just, you know, and he's going kicking and screaming yes. and you're getting exalted and you're, you know what it's like, it's someone who's drowning and you're trying to save them, but they don't want to be saved. So they're like, there's just like dead weight just being pulling you down. And you're like, wait, like I'm swimming and I'm trying to keep us both afloat, yeah. you know? And I remember my, my marriage at the end, it was like, oh, I was like, I'm literally drowning and you don't even care that I am kicking and my arms are tired. And I, I'm trying to carry us both. Cause I try to get us to go to therapy and he just was not into, he's like, I'm not doing that. You know, I refuse to do that. Like we went once and it was awful because he said nothing throughout the entire session. <laughs> and then when we got in the car, he like erupted on me. <laughs> And it was horrible. <laughs> I'm like, well, you just had a full hour to say your piece. And you said like nothing. And I'm like, I'm venting. I'm like, well, this is what frustrates me. He doesn't listen. He doesn't see. He doesn't care. He's insensitive. He's da, da, da. And, you know, I'm like when he does this, this is how it makes me feel. And I get in the car and he's like, well, you just painted me out to be the bad guy. I'm like, but you didn't say anything. Like, you get a chance to say what you need to say. In but the if he had said something. That opens him up to critique. Right. So that's what he said. Nothing. <laughs> he just sat there like it was terrible. So, you know, people knowing like their best. So again, that's an example of his boundaries too. Like he just didn't want to be vulnerable in that space. Didn't own his crap. He didn't want to own it. You got to own your crap. Like yeah. I, re I recognize the role I played in that situation by me wanting to be all things and all to, <laughs> you know, like fix it all. And in sacri and sacrificing your own happiness your own health I think when you start getting sick you realize like wait a minute is this worth it is this actually worth it where I can't get out of bed because I'm exhausted I have another cold or a flu my stomach's in knots my skin I've got hate rash <laughs> like, when you're like wait a second I'm giving myself hate rash how is this relationship good for me <laughs> yeah Right. My bank <laughs> account, and, it's not right. And my bank account's getting emptier and emptier. And it's just like, no, no, it's not. Like that's when you start to weigh up, like, what's actually good for me? And what do I what do I deserve? Like, do I do I deserve more? Yeah. Is yeah, that what you're gonna really talk really about in your answer. workshop? Like you're gonna talk about that in your workshop? Yeah. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna do a lot of exercises on kind of digging in there and, and looking at what's underneath, right? You know, if you're coming to this workshop, you know, you need help with boundaries. Um, and I've had a lot of people <laughs> raise their hand to come to this thing. And I understand why. Um, and so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about like codependency and boundaries, and then we're going to start getting in there and figuring out why, like what's underneath that you don't feel like you can set those boundaries for yourself. You yeah. know, if you're people pleasing, if you're codependent, um, you know, if you're struggling with your confidence and self-esteem, that's coming from somewhere, right? You know, we have all of our thoughts are habitual. We have these patterns that we have for ourselves, And so where did those come from? And then how can you start to, to stop those cycles for yourself? Um, so we're going to do one. It's my favorite exercise. We talk about your voice of judgment. It's your inner critic. What is it saying to you? Like, we're going to name it. We're going to personify it. Wow. Do it. <laughs> wow. It sounds Great very right powerful. Now. Very, awesome. very powerful. So um, then we're going to do some journaling and some meditation. And um, and all of this too leads into uh, a course that I teach called the Clarity Catalyst. And I have one coming up where we're going to focus just on boundaries. It's an eight-week journey. We talk about creative thinking, we talk about intuition, we talk about our voice of judgment, um, we talk about interpersonal relationships talk about money. Um, you know, we talk about creative thinking and getting out of that, you know, that mindset that whatever our mindset is, right. Cause we get so stuck. And so opening ourselves up to, to different ways of thinking is the basis for this. 
Um, and so that is, I haven't scheduled it yet, but it's going to be sometime in May that we start. So um, if y'all want to come to the workshop, there's a link to register for it. Um, please come join me. We're going to talk about all this stuff and more. And um, in the description for this video too, you can find Raywin's website. Please go visit and check her out and check out her awesome work. Um, and maybe we can even in the comments, uh, we can put a link to download um, one of your resources too. Yeah, so we'll do that. Cool. Um, cool. All right. So I think, I think that's it for now. I mean, I could sit here and talk about this all day. <laughs> I know. It's, I'm, I'm glad that you've got a place that people can actually work with you like over the next, you know, over an extended period of time to work through some of this stuff because, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Like, you know, you, you and I just talked about like, it took us years. Uh, you can try and condense that into like a few weeks, a few, you know, two months, couple of months or whatever, you know, change, but change is, you know, change takes time. Yeah. And You're one yeah. thing I do love about this course, and I, so I took it as a student, now I teach it, but part of the reason I love it so much is I started doing this work and I was like, oh, I've done all this. Mm -hmm. this, this does work. Like mm -hmm. this is the process. And then even going through this, I mean, every time I teach it, I learn something else. Wow. I've learned something new, like a 10 peel back that. another layer. And, you know, when I took it as a student, I was like, oh, I'm an anxiety edit. I got to do something about that. And huge difference. Um, so, yes. So y'all come join me. Come join me for the workshop. See if it's kind of work you want to do. And then we will talk about doing the Clarity Catalyst together. Awesome. Very cool. Well, good luck with it, Maggie. And thanks so much for today for giving me a chance to talk about stuff that I haven't talked about ever until now. Thank you for being vulnerable and joining me. This is awesome. It feels good. It feels good to get it off your chest, you know? So yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.